Representative Sampson of the 80th. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise in opposition to this amendment. And, of course, it's a strike-all amendment, so it will become the bill. And it uh, goes without saying that the, the bill has similar language, and I would be opposed to that even if this amendment does fail. On the surface, I think there is some support for this measure because it kind of feels good. As the uh, proponent uh, mentioned, uh, it's uh, something that uh, uh, seems simple enough, that if we require folks that are selling their homes to have smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in place, then uh, there is a mo greater likelihood that uh, they will be in place and functioning for the new owner and uh, hopefully prevent any uh, potential tragedy from occurring. The problem is that in the real world, things are much more complicated than this. The first thing is that there are lots of types of transactions. Uh, it's not so simple all the time that you would be selling a perfectly good home to another, to another uh, buyer. Uh, sometimes you're talking about homes that are in need of repair. Sometimes they are in need of such repair that the new owner has no intention of living in the house or even uh, trying to repair it. They might even be knocking it down. Uh, so it, this creates some problems on, on a number of different levels. There's also transactions between uh, different types of buyers and sellers, whether they are folks that uh, are having uh, financial distress before their sale. Uh, there are uh, transactions where the parties know very little about the property because maybe it was a family member who passed the property. Uh, maybe it's a bank involved and they've never even seen the place. I have some questions, but before I do, I want to just kind of frame this uh, to let people know what the concerns are. I think there are two major concerns. The first one is that, to me, this is uh, a simple example of what some people would call big government. It's a situation where we are getting involved in a private transaction between private individuals or maybe possibly corporations that are transferring a piece of real property. And to me, I don't see any reason why we need to be involved in that other than some level of consumer protection. But I don't think that this is it. And the second issue I have is that I think it fundamentally changes real estate transactions forever. Currently, when you sell your house to someone and you hand them the keys, once they become the owner, that house is their responsibility. And all of the checks and balances to determine what was being bought and what the condition of the property have already been determined, and the liability of the seller ends on that day. Of course, there might be some liability that might extend if the seller did something overtly wrong. They purposely tried to hide something or they uh, misrepresented something in some of the documents at the time of the transaction. But outside of that, they're not going to be liable for the condition of the property. And this changes that. Because now we're going to be telling sellers that you are going to swear to an affidavit that you have working smoke detectors and working carbon monoxide detectors in the home. And it seems to me that you created a liability at that point that never goes away. The new buyer moves into the house and maybe a day goes by or a week or a year or five years. But if something happens, there's a fire or, God forbid, there's a uh, tragic death because of carbon monoxide poisoning, the fact is, that previous seller is going to be sued. And I think that it would be very difficult for them to be able to genuinely prove that they were not liable for uh, the situation. I mean, the fact is that homeowners, by and large, are not experts about how fire, uh, um, uh, smoke detectors, rather, and or carbon monoxide detectors are to be installed and whether or not they're working. I think most people, I mean, have no idea whether their carbon monoxide system works or not, really, other than going over to push the button. But I don't think that guarantees anything, really. And even if that seller hired someone prior to the sale to come and verify that these things are working, I don't think that eliminates the liability either. It may transfer to the person that ultimately did that verification, but I still think that the liability extends beyond the transfer of the property and one person handing the keys to the other. And I think that's a big concern, because I think that we live in a society that is used to a certain way of doing business in real estate, and that is that it's the buyer's responsibility to make sure to know what they're getting. And I see that year after year, we keep transferring more and more responsibility to the seller. 
Now, I don't know if a lot of people in here are very familiar with something called the Residential Property Condition Disclosure Report, but this is a document that is required for every seller when they sell a, a home in our state uh, to present to a buyer. And there's numerous questions on there. And uh, just last year, we actually added uh, questions about these exact issues. Uh, there was a question on there that asked if there are any known problems with the smoke detectors in the house and or uh, the carbon monoxide detectors. And that's a, real, a legitimate question to ask a seller, I think. And it's something that you could go back to them if they were overtly uh, lying about uh, the condition of these, this situation. But to get them to swear that it's working at the time of sale and that it's up to code and that sort of thing, I think is a, a bit of a stretch. And it seems to me that as we keep adding things to this disclosure report, we are asking the seller to warrant more and more the condition of the house. And I think while the proponents of this type of legislation would say that we're making the world safer, I think what's happening is you're actually doing the opposite because you have people that are less inclined to actually do what they should do as a buyer, and that is get a home inspection from an independent uh, contractor that specialized in that field who is going to tell them the exact condition of the property so that they can make the proper decisions on whether to make the purchase or it can be negotiated to whether or not repairs would be made. I have a, a few questions through the uh, uh, speaker, if you would, to the proponent of the bill. Please frame your question, sir. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I said from the outset, uh, there are a lot of types of transactions. So I would just have to, like to ask the proponent if there are any types of transactions uh, outside of what's listed in uh, Section E that are exempt from this particular bill. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fox. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the representative uh, for his question. And in addition, uh, for his commentary and insight in our conversations over the past few days, knowing full well of his expertise and profession, the job he holds outside of this chamber, I appreciate his insight into this issue and, and, and perspective. Uh, there are a number of, of, of transfers that are exempt uh, from the underlying statute. Um, as indicated in my introductory remarks, uh, first, uh, any any uh, uh, home for which a building permit was issued on or after October 1, 2005 through the present date uh, and moving forward, uh, those uh, transfers involving those particular pieces of residential real property are exempt. Uh, in addition, uh, the um, uh, exemptions as outlined uh, in subsection E of the statute, uh, are, are, uh, the eight exemptions listed there are also uh, exempt. So the, the underlying statute pertains to, as I said, residential a building designed to be occupied uh, by one or two families. All other uh, buildings uh, are exempt, and anything from October 1, 2005 forward uh, is exempt, as well as the, uh, the, the final subsection of the statute. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for his answers. I want to get to some of the exemptions that are included in that Section E in, in just a minute, but... I want to know, first and foremost, whether there is any exemptions that have anything to do with the condition of the property, whether it has a certificate of occupancy, whether it is a, a building that's condemned, uh, or it's in major need of repair. Are there any exceptions made in any way for that uh, concern, that basically the condition of the property? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fox. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I, if the gentleman could clarify the question, he's asking if if there are, and is there an exemption for a building that has a certificate of occupancy? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What I'm driving at is, is in the real world, uh, real property is sold uh, in varying conditions. Of course, you know, I think that the bill makes uh, uh, sense if you look at it from a perspective of we're only talking about homes that are complete and move-in ready. But there are other types of real property for sale. There are homes that could not be lived in because they need entire uh, you know, rehabilitation. There are homes that will never be lived in because the new buyer intends to knock it down and start over or, or maybe use the property for something else. And then there are homes that are under construction and have yet to even be completed to the point where uh, there might be a way to install uh, uh, carbon monoxide detectors or smoke detectors because there's just a foundation, for instance. 
Through you, Madam Speaker. Any uh, at all uh, exception for condition or um, state of construction? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fox. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Homes that are currently under construction are exempt. They will, they will fall under the category of homes being built on or after October 1, 2005 forward. Uh, beyond that, and I, I understand the example the representative is providing, if, if in fact there was a lack of a better word, abandoned property uh, that was being transferred to a, uh, a new buyer with that home uh, be exempt. Unless it was uh, built on or after October, or unless a building permit for new occupancy was issued on or after October 1, 2005 forward, or unless one of the, uh, unless the residential uh, home falls under one of the uh, eight sections contained within subsection E, uh, the answer, I think, to the representative's question is no. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and again, thank you to the gentleman for those answers. I, I think that's just one indication of a problem we have, is that uh, there are going to be some circumstances where it just doesn't make sense for a seller uh, to, uh, uh, you know, install uh, smoke detectors or carbon monoxide detectors, uh, and the buyer has no desire for them either. And I think they would both be uh, in, in agreement on that subject, yet this law is going to come between them and require them to do something beyond that. The, the point I'm trying to make is that, is that people that are buying and selling uh, homes and conducting all sorts of business in our society, for, for the most part, they're big boys and girls. Uh, and uh, in uh, a real estate transaction, there are other folks involved. You have uh, real estate professionals to guide those uh, individuals to make sure that they are protected in some uh, respects. There are home inspectors that are there to protect buyers to make sure that they're not buying a home that might be at risk to them. And of course, they have uh, legal representation in virtually every case to make sure that the contract uh, is uh, written correctly and that uh, some of the same things are, are already looked after. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, in Section B, this is where we talk about uh, if someone is uh, not going to comply, they have the option of transferring uh, this, uh, a credit to the buyer in the amount of $250. So through you, Madam Speaker, I'm wondering if uh, the uh, good gentleman would tell me where the number $250 came from. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fox. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I thank the representative for the question. and is indeed a very good one. That figure was reached at, uh, again, that figure will be for individuals who um, must install battery-operated smoke detection equipment in their homes. The figure is based on a estimate uh, reached at after conversations uh, with realtors and fire marshals throughout the state uh, that uh, $250 would be sufficient uh, to cover the cost uh, involved with installing smoke battery-operated smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in your home pursuant to the statute. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sampson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, thank you to the gentleman for that answer. I think that would depend a great deal on the size of the home. I mean, if it's a, a, a one-bedroom house that might require two battery-operated smoke detectors, maybe it costs them 40 to 40 bucks to uh, buy a couple of them at Walmart. But this uh, law makes no distinction for the size of a home so uh, or the size of the real property at all. So it could be considerably more than that $250 as well. But I think the larger point is that I think the $250 should not be measured against the cost of making the repair. But what it's truly doing is uh, eliminating the liability of the seller, which could be infinitesimal. So it seems to me that as a realtor, if I was in a situation where I was working with a seller and I had to instruct them on their best practices in this particular case, and they were uh, being asked to swear that they uh, uh, had uh, the proper equipment uh, installed uh, based on this uh, legislation, I would tell them that the safest bet is to just pay the $250. Because I think even if they went through the effort of hiring someone to come out to the house and verify that it's in working order, there is nothing to say that some tragedy might happen at some point in the future, and uh, they could be sued for it. Whereas a simple $250 charge uh, eliminates that. Would that be correct through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Fox. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I again thank the representative for the question. Um, the idea with the $250 uh, uh, fee, um, the ultimate goal of the underlying statute is we want to encourage, uh, if we can, uh, the affidavit. We want to encourage the installation of, of smoke detection equipment and carbon monoxide detection equipment in the home. 
um, the hope is that uh, should a fee be uh, uh, should with the fee being required, should they choose to go that way? Uh, and I, I will say to the representative that there was conversations as these negotiations negotiations continued on over the past several weeks that that figure be much higher than $250. Again, with the hope being of encouraging uh, uh, the affidavit and the installation of of of, of these de this detection equipment in the home. Um, with the $250, uh, at, the, at the very least, uh, uh, we, we think it's an appropriate fee uh, that will be uh, 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 commiserate with, with the cost associated with installing the smoke detection equipment, as well as providing an opportunity uh, for the smoke detection equipment and the installment thereof being part of a conversation uh, at, at the point of transaction when title is being transferred. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to the ge good gentleman for his answers. Although I, I would say that my question was uh, uh, not really answered. What I w was trying to determine whether is whether or not there is liability created for the seller through this legislation, and uh, whether or not it continues beyond the uh, transfer of the title and the keys, and if the two hundred and fifty dollars negates that liability at some point assuming uh, that that point might be the, uh, the date of the transfer. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fox. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, if, if a transferor decides to uh, provide the $250 credit uh, to the transferee at the transfer, of t at the transfer of title, then the transferor is not affirming anything. Uh, so in, in essence, uh, they will not be affirming the presence of uh, smoke detection equipment in the house. So the, the short answer uh, to the second part of your question, are we negating liability or removing liability? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, there would be an opportunity uh, for the transfer to not affirm uh, anything uh, and instead uh, pr provide, uh, provide the, 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 the credit uh, in its place. The first part of the question, I believe, Madam Speaker, uh, had to do with uh, the, the exposure uh, and the liability and potential risk of, of liability or continued liability placed upon the transferor should that individual choose to, to, to file the affidavit. Uh, the answer to that question, um, uh, Madam Speaker, is that in filing the affidavit, uh, the transfer will be affirming that upon transfer of title, uh, the premises uh, has present and working smoke detection and carbon monoxide equipment. Um, the, the transfer is not affirming as to that equipment beyond the date of transfer of title. The affirmation is, is specifically geared towards uh, the time of transfer of title. Th title. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's a number of attorneys uh, in the room, and I hope that uh, when we get done uh, having our conversation that uh, maybe uh, they might explore the uh, concept of what liability is created uh, by this affidavit being part of the transaction and uh, what the likelihood of a lawsuit uh, in the event of a uh, tragedy that happens after the sale might be. Uh, because I'm, I'm quite certain that, that that's exactly what this does. And uh, for the life of me, I think that that's not really an argument because otherwise it wouldn't exist. I mean, the, the reason for this is to basically force a seller to comply um, rather than encourage, uh, as was described by the proponent, um, through the threat that they might be liable for some type of inaction. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, in Section C, it's, uh, I think it's curious that we've asked that the smoke detection and warning equipment be installed and on line 21, it says, in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. And uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I'm wondering why we are choosing to do it uh, and require it through uh, accordance with the manufacturer's instructions versus what the building code might be. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fox. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and, and through to the uh, representative with the question. Uh, we've complied uh, with the, 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 the uh, subsection 2 of section C uh, pertains to the manufacturer's instructions. That section pertains to battery-operated smoke detection equipment. Uh, as such, the, the, the smoke detection equipment as provided uh, will be contained in, in presumably in a, in, a, in a box, including instructions as to its installation, uh, as opposed to uh, the, 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 the building code. So the smoke detection equipment uh, installed pursuant to subsection C will be battery operated uh, and as such will be installed pursuant to the manufacturer's instructions. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thanks to the gentleman for his answer. I, again, I think you just described what the, uh, the bill says, uh, but I would suggest that uh, in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions is 
something that is uh, significantly less be than the uh, uh, building code. Uh, if, after all, we won't know what the instructions would say for the many, many different brands of uh, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors that exist in the marketplace. Uh, they could come with no instructions whatsoever. So uh, in that case, uh, it, you could make the argument that maybe the seller complied no matter what they did. Um, in Section E, there are a number of folks that are exempt from this requirement. And uh, as we already described, I think that the ones that uh, might have had the best argument for being exempt, those folks that uh, would agree that uh, a, these uh, detectors not be installed because they have no need for them uh, because of the condition or state of the property, uh, are not listed, but there are some other uh, situations that are indicated. And I noticed that there are transfers by the federal government are indicated. And I'm wondering uh, through you, uh, Madam Speaker, why is it we are excusing the government from being able to transfer property and not have this obligation? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fox. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the representative for his question. Uh, the, the exemptions, for the most part, were, were, were taken uh, from the exemption, uh, exemptions other, seen in other various places in statute. Uh, we, the federal government was exempted uh, be, because it was contained in other areas uh, of statute under the exemptions. I think the practical matter of the fact is that, that, that it will be often be rare uh, when the federal government will, in fact, own a piece of residential real property uh, uh, for one or two, two family homes uh, and thereafter transfer it. Uh, but I understand the gentleman's questions and can only respond to by saying that these exemptions are elsewhere in statute uh, and for that reason were contained therein. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thanks to the gentleman again for his answer. And again, I, forgive me for uh, putting you on the spot there. I know that's not the, the best question to answer in the world, is why uh, the government would see, uh, seek to uh, excuse themselves from uh, a situation that they would require from the, the rest of uh, the population. And uh, I think it's the kind of thing that upsets uh, people on the street on a, on a daily basis, that uh, the government tends to make its own rules uh, but doesn't necessarily uh, live by the same rules that they make for everyone else. Uh, and again, uh, I point out that those are federal uh, government is what we're talking about, so it's, it's not us this time. <laughs> um, I think I'm done with my question, so I'll let the uh, good gentleman sit down. But uh, I just want to wrap up. Uh, briefly and reiterate some of the concerns that I have. Uh, from the beginning, uh, I think I started by saying that uh, the concern here is whether or not the government should have any say in a private transaction, a contract between two willing parties or more uh, for the sale of real property. And uh, I don't think that they should. And uh, I think that most people on the street, if asked, they would also agree that the government's only role is to protect the parties in case one of them... Uh, does not uh, comply with the uh, uh, requirements of their agreement, not uh, to be involved in the agreement in the first place. And the second thing is that I think that we are uh, doing something very dangerous by altering the way real estate transactions are made. Uh, as I described, I think we are weakening the entire transaction process, which normally relies on a, a, a real estate agent representing a buyer, uh, encouraging that buyer to do their due diligence to make sure that they are fully aware of the property that they're buying by hiring a home inspector and uh, being sure that that uh, house has been inspected and they are fully informed on what they're getting and also from a, a, a standpoint of being able to negotiate the sale properly. As we continue to make that disclosure that is required of sellers more and more all-encompassing, uh, there is less and less likelihood that buyers are going to uh, feel the need to get uh, an inspection. We're feeling that the seller's already warrantied uh, so many things uh, are in good repair. And that goes to the heart of this matter, and that is why are we stopping here? I mean, if we're going to say uh, there is a genuine danger that someone might uh, be hurt in a fire or by smoke damage or by carbon monoxide, so much so that we're going to require a seller to say uh, that these things are updated and uh, are in working order at the time of the sale. Why are we stopping here? Why are we not saying, oh, gee, the electric uh, system in the house has to be up to snuff, too? Uh, certainly people uh, are, suffer tragedies because of uh, electrical fires and homes that are miswired, yet we're not making any requirement the seller, uh, you know, swears an affidavit that their electric system in their home has been wired properly. Or, for that matter, the heating system. And that's another concern that I have is that I think that when you start talking about carbon monoxide, the heating system is a part and component part of that system. 
So for someone to swear an affidavit that the system is working properly and not producing carbon monoxide, they are not only saying that the carbon monoxide system is working properly, but also that their heating system is not generating carbon monoxide. We have gone... I really wish I knew where the origins of uh, the way, uh, you know, these private transactions came from. I, I'd love to be able to say, gee, you know, it's British common law for, you know, a thousand years or something like that and came over here or something like that. I don't really know. But the fact of the matter is that people on the street realize that when you have a private transaction, that it's the buyer's responsibility to protect themselves. And uh, this is the way real estate certainly has been conducted uh, since this country began. And uh, people know that they need to protect themselves by getting a home inspector and making sure the house is properly inspected. They know that they need to get an attorney to make sure that they're buying the right piece of property and that the property lines are where they expect them to be and that there are no uh, encumbrances or, uh, you know, liens on the property that they don't expect. So I think we're changing things by putting something extra on the seller that was not there before. And to me, it's the start of something much larger. And for those reasons, Madam Speaker, I, I can't, in good conscience, even though this bill on the surface feels good, it, it's like, oh yes, we're going to help prevent a catastrophe at some point in the future. I don't believe we are. I think that the system works the way it is. I know tragedies have occurred, but tragedies will occur in our society. Because we are taking this extra step, I don't think we're protecting anyone. In fact, we're leaving the buyer with less of a desire to protect themselves. And they are ultimately who's responsible for themselves. Thank you, Madam Speaker.